So on today's video I thought I'd talk all about the band where our, my personal love affair with everything Canadian and North American on the label started and that band is Rise. So, when did I find out about Rise? Well, um, if you've seen some of the previous recent videos, you'll know that I'd moved to Plastic Head, and in early 92, I was sort of a bit, struggling a bit to get paid by them. Uh, so, but I was sort of building up my mail order as well through trading and stuff like that. So I came up with this great idea and thought, well, if they're not gonna pay me, then I'll perhaps get some stock off them, equivalent to what they owe me. So, uh, so that's what I did. So I got in stuff like um, Dagnasty's Field Day LP, I think, because I think they were distributing Wee Bite at the time, so it was the like the European version of that. And um, I think on their list I saw this thing called Rise, and um, and it was the Joy 12 inch, uh, and it said four tracks in an all Descendants, you know, featuring John Kastner from the Doughboys and stuff like this. And I thought, oh, that sounds interesting because I, you know, I. I was getting into the Doughboys at the time as well and John just sings backing vocals <laughs> on that session he was never in the band but they just had him in the studio doing some harmonies and stuff so anyway the um, the Joy 12 inch turned up in this thing and I put it on and just went whoa that's good I like that especially um, the the title track Joy Um, send them a letter you know to either like do an interview in the fanzine or find out what they were doing and stuff like that and I remember that uh, the guitarist John Pastore wrote back to me now remember we're talking 1992 there is no internet so if there was any band from overseas you had to write an airmail letter out to them wait a couple of weeks for them to receive it wait for them to write back to you and then, and then get the response so um, it, it all took quite a long time, backwards and forwards, I seem to remember. But John basically sent me this long letter saying, oh yeah, we, we toured, we're we just back from touring Germany. We've actually put out like an LP now um, and a seven inch. And I've started a seven inch label called Super Sound that, you know, I want to do just sort of like two song with an A side and a B side, uh, seven inch singles. Um, so we got talking and it's like saying, oh, that sounds interesting and stuff. And I sort of said, well, I don't think anyone is kind of carrying RPN, which was the label in Germany's um, stuff over here and saying, would, you know, could I perhaps carry it for like, you know, I was thinking originally, I think just for sort of like carrying it on our distribution. And then um, we, it, we got talking more and more as these letters went backwards and forwards for the next few months. And, um, the idea came about that I think I called up Ansgar, who was who was running RPN in Germany, and we said, well, what can we do here and stuff? And uh, we came up with the idea of him sending me stock um, that I would then sort of account monthly, and then 
sending back sort of things and just sticker the stock over here as Boss Tunage releases and market them and distribute them as Boss Tunage, um, which worked for me because obviously with all my money kind of tied up in the stock I'd already done, it, it meant that I was still putting releases out. Um, by the time we'd come to do this, I'd actually gone back to Southern. So I knew that Southern would have, um, I think it was the Goober Patrol Dutch Evans album in September 1992 was the first one I'd moved my distribution back to Southern from Plastic Head. And, um, and then we lined up a load of RPM releases for sort of October, November, December moving through, which included the Rise same title LP and CD, which had their demo on it, uh, and also the Where to Find 7-inch. Now I found I remember that John on, on his letters way back then said, "Oh, we've did a pr we've done a promo video when we were in Germany for where to find and stuff." And I'm thinking, "Oh, that'd be good. I could perhaps you know we might get it on, you know, whatever whatever show that would potentially uh, do this." But but we never could work it out or get get round to it. But then I remember that John uncovered it a lot lot later uh, and sent it to me, and I thought it was lost because I I didn't know where it was. But I've actually managed to find a digital copy, so I'm going to play you the original promo for the Where to Find 7-inch single next. So uh, I hope you enjoy it. Remember it was 1992 and we were all a bit younger then. In your eyes, and now you can't bet I'll never 
so I remember that you know me and John were really keen to sort of like you know he was really keen to build on super sound and what he was doing was he was sending me like tapes of loads of like the Canadian bands and the Canadian scene and I was sending him all the UK bands and I remember he really liked Love Junk which was obviously the band that uh, had sort of formed out the ashes of Perfect Days and the Space Maggots um, and uh, he loved this particular song which I think was on their first demo called Kiss by an Angel um, so he was really keen that he wanted to do like Love Junk and I remember speaking to Love Junk about it and we it got there but it, it never got further than kind of um, conversations really um, but that was sort of penciled in for one time he also rise had actually changed singers by the time um, the seven inch and the LP had come out their original singer had left and they'd been replaced by a guy called Mac so the guy that you see sort of miming on the uh, video that I've just shown you isn't actually the singer uh, of that song that was another guy called Sylvian who, who'd left the band by that point um, so Mac, had, they'd gone into the studio and recorded some songs with Mac and this was the first songs that would th eventually end up on their second album, Jack. Um, and it included one called Don't Feel the Same and that was, I know there was a real plan that we wanted to do that as a seven-inch single at, uh, at that time. Obviously, I think to do the seven-inch on Super Sound and then and Boss Tunage and RPN, and then do an L, then do the Jack LP, which was going to be sort of uh, coming into 1993, I think, by the time we were going to uh, put that out. Um, but I remember it. Um, the conversations seemed to be getting more and more sporadic, not necessarily with John, but with Ansgar over in Germany. I mean, he was really busy tour managing, so. When I got the rise stock for the seven inch and the LP that we did, that I actually drove to from Leicester to Cambridge and met him where he was tour roadying and managing Neurosis. So I went and saw Neurosis and picked up, and they. And I remember Neurosis being uh, really pleased that they didn't have all these extra boxes in the back of their uh, their tour bus anymore. Uh, once I sort of loaded up before Capri and and then you know scarped along. Probably with flat tyres because uh, I think I hold the record. My uh, my Capri used to uh, the tyres used to go flat, and I remember checking them once. Once I got home from Lincolnshire, and one of the tyres when there it should obviously be like what 30, 32 psi. Yeah, it was seven. Yeah, so I used to drive around everywhere on flat tyres. It's when I didn't kill myself. But anyway, I digress. So I think the first three releases that we got from RPN um, were, were the ones that we stickered, and then so the two Rise releases and the loose seven inch which I'll talk about briefly on another video um, and then following on from that um, we actually had our details printed on the artwork as the releases came along so that was with life but how to live it and also the asexuals so the stock had been getting a little bit more sporadic getting over to me I think that where like the sales in Germany were going Ansgar was kind of sending me any surplus stock that he had um, so I remember on like the Life About How To Live It, which I'll obviously talk about on a video soon, um, we got the CD version of their album, but not the vinyl version to sell. And I remember sort of speaking to him about that, and uh, we got a load of t-shirts of Life About How To Live It, but not, not the actual vinyl albums. And he's, oh yeah, yeah, I'll get, we're gonna repress it, I'll get you some over. Um, and so it just started to gradually take longer and longer and longer and um, I know that with the Jack uh, album we were like really keen to get it for a while but I think that as it was taking longer and longer um, not knowing what was happening we'd also agreed to obviously do the RAN album with RPM so that that all got kind of a bit mixed up but the, with the communication not coming back the same because I think Ans Ansgar was just so busy and and what have you and, and um, so you know the Jack CD did come out but we ne and it had our sort of like details on the back, but we never got any copies of it from it. 
at the time and it was only a few years later I found out that it had actually come out um, so when, it, when I restarted the label in about uh, 2000 time we did actually get their remaining copies of the CD and, and sold, sold that and that should have kind of probably been the story but there was a really really odd thing happened because I'd lost touch with John and um, I remember that I was working obviously at a CD plant down in London called Making Records in the late 90s and one of my customers was um, Nude Records who did Suede and Geneva and people like that and my contact there was a girl called Michelle, Michelle Kerry who I'm still in touch with now and um, I remember I must have called her about something and I think she was, might have been working from home and I called her on a mobile because it was an urgent thing and um, she said this is really odd Aston but uh, did you used to run a record label it's just my flatmate John thinks that he might know you and lo and behold it was John Pastore from Rise um, was sharing this flat so we got back in touch and, um, you know, and John knew Ed Wen and stuff through Bert Queeroys. Um, so yeah, so we met up and stuff and it was great to sort of reconnect with him and talk through it all. And then um, and he started to tell me, well, we did actually record tracks for a third album, um, but it never came out. I've got the dat tape somewhere and that before we sort of all, you know, it all imploded. So I said, well, I'd love to do a, like a Rise Best Of CD on Boss Tunage, you know, I'm setting the label back up again. It'd be good to get some of those songs out that, you know, the later Rise stuff. And so that's how the Freezer Burn comp came out. when he compiled the uh, the thing the DAT tape was almost disintegrating so they literally ran it through the machine once I think to get the copy that ended up on freezer burn of these eight nine tracks um, that start off freezer burn and um, you know so we were very lucky to it that it hadn't got lost forever um, I've, since then I've always kept in sort of sporadic touch with John uh, he actually is over in New York these days and runs outer battery records who've done quite a few uh, interesting releases so uh, yes yeah, so um, Rise if you, you know a brilliant brilliant band you know on the sort of like more rocky grunge end of the melodic punk side of things um, yeah I love loved the stuff at the time it was you know it was con in, always being played uh, and it was really great to do freezer burn uh, the comp uh, to uh, to uh, sort of round the story off and uh, that's it for this video I'll see you on the next one